and I'd just like to introduce this evening. So tonight we're joined by Robert Brown. Um, Robert will be talking to us about the idea of atmosphere in his layout and he uh, how he's tried to build it from conception at thumbnail sketch stage through to the, the um, layout as you've seen it on the video that you will have watched. He's going to explore for us how he introduced perspective on a flat black back screen without it clashing with 3D scenery and how he uses colours and tones to create apparent depth. Robert's been asked a number of times to explain the use of forced perspective in his model buildings. And he says it isn't an exact science. It's more like traditional theatre scenery design. But there are various ideas and methods that he's going to explain to us to help people who are trying to get that perspective tonight. Um, he'll also be able to tell us how he gradually compressed the depth of the buildings in Lenidris as they approached the back scene and how he arrived at the distorted shapes that were needed. Um, I've certainly watched that video a few times now and can't tell where the buildings end and the back scene begins. It just gives you amazing depth of field. So Robert, welcome. Thank you very, very much for joining us this evening. Um, I'm going to put you on spotlight um, so that everything that anybody sees is you. Um, I've just missed that. You've actually, can you just stop screen sharing for a moment, Robert? Because I wasn't quick enough for you. Let me just do that first. Right, is that all right? I believe yeah. spotlight is on, Jackie. Spotlight's on now, yep. Okay, well, thanks. Thank you very much, Jackie. Um, very kind of, your, your introduction was uh, very flattering, and uh, I'm very flattered generally to be asked to do this this evening. In spite of all the technical glitches, I hope everybody will be able to hear what I'm talking about. Um, now, would you like me to start the slide, so Jackie? Yes, please. That would be lovely. Thank you. Okay. Now, hopefully, everybody can see my screen now. Yes, that's perfect. That's great. Okay. Well, before I go into any technical stuff, I thought I'd just say a word or two about planet risk, the layout in general, so that people understand the background of what the layout is all about. Now, you're probably aware that planet risk is not a real place. It's uh, an imaginary village. Uh, somewhere to the north of Abashafeni, which is somewhere to the north of Corris. If you're familiar with the Corris Railway, you may know that Abashafeni is the sort of northern outpost of the Corris Railway. At least that's where the uh, steam uh, coal trains stopped. Uh, I've read that there really was a plan to buy the Corris Railway um, a plan from both the Cambrian Railways and the Great Western Railways to convert the line to a standard gauge line running through from the country to this gear. And they got as far as passing an act of parliament that would have allowed this to happen. Um, obviously, it never did happen. But in my world, that's what happened. And we've moved forward in time to 1946. The railway has flourished and then started to wither, leading up to the Second World War, by which time it was in a state of some disrepair. Now, in my story, my backstory, the railway had struggled on into the war, and uh, during the war, there was an army camp that needed access to the railway, and so they kept it going. The army engineers built a, uh, a passing loop to allow trains to be uh, reversed at San Idris. And that's, that's where we are now in 1944. So I'll just move forward, hopefully move forward one slide. Let's see if this is going to work. Right. Uh, that is, uh, that red block is roughly where I imagine Planidris would have been. Uh, you can see Cardigan Bay, and you can see in the middle of the screen, Corris. 
I don't know how well that will show up on your different devices, but that's to give you an idea of where Flanidris is meant to be. And in a bit more detail, this shows the part of the line that I imagine extending out from Flanidris to Bristia, which is uh, more or less on the line from Dolketsley to um, Barmer. And that that is roughly the path that my imaginary line would have taken. Now, in my world, the narrow gauge railways are bound, and two lines encountered Flanidrid. Uh, one of them crossed it, the other one ran adjacent to it, and this is one end of the uh, narrow gauge engine shed and the water tank in a state of decay. You can see it's meant to be very rusty. Now, the engine shed there, some of you may recognize the style as being from Myers Palace on the Corris Railway. I should have, at this stage, I should apologize for my dreadful Welsh pronunciation. Uh, so if there are any Welsh people listening, I'm very sorry about my abuse of your uh, pronunci of, uh, of Welsh pronunciation. I do my best. Now, during the war, a catastrophic flood, or just at the beginning of the war, a catastrophic flood has completely destroyed the line to the north of the station. And uh, it's been the line has been truncated at the bridge at the north end of the station. And you can see here, looking under the bridge, that there's flood water that has leaked through onto the track bed. And the scaffolding on the left is meant to be where people are repairing the bridge that's been badly uh, damaged by flood water. There's a pile of sandbags at the back, which is left over from when the flooding was at its height. Now, this is looking towards the north end of the station, and you can see that there's a crossing, uh, a crossover between the two lines, which has been built, uh, as I say, by the army engineers during the war to allow trains to be reversed. The passing loop would have originally been much longer, uh, but the other end of it is now underwater. That's uh, a broader view of the station uh, looking north. I should probably stop at this point, say a word about vaccines, because I know that that's what has that interested most people about my layout. Now, what you're looking at in the vaccine there is on two walls of my shed, and somewhere in the centre, you might just be able to make out that the vaccine goes through a 90 degree bend. It's actually a piece of hardboard that's been bent into a sharp curve uh, and fixed the wall of my shed. So we're looking at, on the right hand side, we're looking at uh, a flat surface in one direction. And on the left hand side, we're looking at a flat surface at 90 degrees to it. Uh, now, there are two or three things I'd say about the vaccine. First of all, People have commented on misty effects and uh, depth. There are a number of ways that I've tried to achieve this. One of them is using something called aerial perspective. Uh, I'll go on to talk about that a little bit more later, but aerial perspective is not to do with the drawing of shape. It's to do with the way that colors and tones change when things are further away. It's, a, it's an aerial perspective term that artists use to describe colours being lightened and made less saturated when they're in the distance. Uh, obviously, there's always a lot of moisture and dust in the air. So when you see a colour of a distant hillside, it's not going to look the same as when you see it close to you. Uh, and to achieve this, 
what I've done is to mix my sky colours, my the pale bluey grey colours, into the colours that I would expect the hillsides to be. The further away each part of the hillside is, the more of that sky colour I've mixed in. Could I just stop at this point and just check that everyone is able to hear me okay? Uh, so, um, head with... No, I'm getting nods of heads and thumbs yeah. up. Okay. Right. The, the second thing I've done, after painting the basic colours of the landscape, is to use something called stumbling. I think that's another arty term. S-C-U-M-B. L I N G, meaning rubbing on a pale colour with a really dry paint with a with a rough brush over the top of what I've already painted when it's dry to uh, create the cloudy effect. Now I've used a number of types of paint on this background, and I to some extent I used whatever was to hand for the pale, misty, cloudy colours. I happen to have an old tin of uh, off-white gloss paint, which was uh, which is an oil mix paint that you probably couldn't buy in our regime. But I, I used it with a, uh, an old brush that was in bad condition with fairly stiff brittles and rubbed it on um, in the direction that I wanted my banks of mist and cloud to go. Uh, when it looks too thick, I just wipe it off with a cloth. If it looked right, I'd leave it. Now, using that paint caused a huge amount of um, very smelly vapour to, to go into the air. So I had to keep all the windows well open. I mean, it's a large area, and uh, doors and windows were open to allow ventilation. And I didn't spend too long in there at any one time. Um, it was gloss paint, so it left a shiny gloss surface, which I didn't want. So what I've done is to use matte varnish over the top of it. Now, matte varnish is not always very matte. So I mixed a lot of Johnson's baby powder into the uh, varnish to make it more matte. It works very well, but you have to use quite a lot of it. And now the painting is more or less completely matte. Uh, as far as the painting goes, that's really all I need to say at the moment. There's only one other point. Um, if you can see the dry stone wall, uh, which I don't know whether you can, can you see my mouth pointer? Yes, you can. Well, where I'm indicating the dry stone wall there, in this part, that's actually a real model wall. Up here, it's painted on vaccine. And, and um, in the bit behind the good shed that you can't see, it sort of blends from one thing to the other by being done in low relief on the vaccine with, with a bit of uh, modelling clay. To make it look as though it goes up the hillside, I deliberately did this fairly shallow diagonal angle I made a point of not doing anything too perpendicular because, to my mind, that often spoils back scene. When you have roads or stone walls that seem to go straight up in the air, that completely takes away the illusion of depth. But if you keep to fairly shallow diagonals, you don't get that problem. With something like a dry stone wall, you're not going to know exactly how much it goes into the distance or exactly how sloping it should be. I mean, in, in real life, if you look at a distant dry stone wall, it's very difficult to tell exactly how long it is or, or what angle it's at. So I'm taking advantage of that uh, in the way I've painted it. It means that I can uh, step to one side or the other and the perspective still works. Right, I'll move on. Now, this is the southern end of the layout. And if we start by looking at the back scene, once again, I've used aerial perspective in the colours and tones of the back scene. And the hill that's in the background, which you can see up here, the hilltop there, is very nearly the 
same colour as the sky, uh, just a, a tad darker. It's certainly not gr uh, grass green colour. Um, you know, it's got much more sky colour than the local colour of whatever that surface was. But the same with this hill here. That's also the hill on the left here that I'm pointing to. That's also much paler than the kind of colours that I've been using, the modelled areas that I've been using in the foreground. So it looks further away. When you look at the buildings here, I'm pointing at the moment to the chapel, if you can see where I'm pointing. Yes. Uh, okay. The chapel may well have had uh, black barge boards or gutters, but I didn't go anywhere near the black paint. If something some way back in the distance, you want it to look further away and maybe a little bit misty, then there's no need to use any really dark tones. You keep your palette of colours to uh, very much into the lighter area and don't use anything that's too saturated in colour. When I say saturated, I mean like a very strong, rich colour, because that's going to pop out of the picture and jump forwards at you. But it's a matter of controlling, for me, it's a matter of controlling how much um, saturation or how dark I want each area to be. So if I move my cursor along these houses here, you might be able to see that this one here, for example, which is painted on the back seat, has got stronger tones and colours than the chapel in the background. So I think it helps it to come forward into the uh, foreground. When I move forward into the areas that are partially modelled, like this house here where I'm pointing now, that rooftop is stuck to the back scene, but it is in low relief. So there is card and a little bit of modelling clay, I think, um, bringing it slightly out from the back scene. And again, I've restrained the colours a little bit, so the colours and tones are not nearly as rich as they are in the model buildings that are in the foreground. Uh, I will go into this again further as we go on. Um, on the right hand side you can see the tunnel now which leads into the storage yard under the hillside. Uh, that, that's meant to represent the route to uh, uh, south, southwards towards the country. Um, the layout is built on baseboards that more or less follow the methods of uh, Barry Norm, uh, his book Landscape Modelling, uh, briefly outlines uh, his methods of um, using a plywood sandwich to create the strong cross members the girders to build the sections to lay up on. That's more or less what I've done here. Now, this particular baseboard, like one or two of the others, has actually been chopped and changed around a bit as time went on. So although I tried to prepare as well as I could, there have been changes made along the route. Uh, while I'm showing you this, on, on the right hand side you can see the train turntable, which is perched on top of this framework here. Uh, the framework is on the casters, so it can be pulled out, pulled away from the wall, and the trains can be rotated through 180 degrees. And the tracks uh, on the turntable are aligned with the main running line by using pasturing bolts, which you can see in the picture. Uh, the legs uh, that support the baseboards are built with um, CLS timber, the, the stuff that people use for building stuff, partitions and that kind of thing. I think it's, uh, it's, a, it's a real um, sort of bargain for people doing this kind of thing because it's relatively cheap, it's straight, it has rounded off corners, it's reliably free from um, jiggers and all, all the kind of problems that timber from DIY merchants usually comes with, and it's very strong. Now, at the other end of the layout, looking underneath here, you can see that I've used some chipboard to form the curved front area and as a result that particular board is very heavy it's um, definitely a, a two-person job to shift it uh, 
as a result, this layout is definitely not what I would describe as portable. It's more or less transportable, but, it's, but moving, it would be a major operation. So, although it's, it's been very nice to be asked to show it at an exhibition, I've had to say no because it's really far too much of a job to think of uh, trying to move it. That shows the whole of the uh, layout baseboard set in under construction. Um, I think it sort of speaks for itself, really. Very good. Now, the track work was done with C&L track work, and uh, I built the uh, point work to OMS standards because I'd read that you get uh, less of a tendency for wheel sets to drop into the holes in the crossings and more realistic narrower flangeways. Uh, I don't have any kind of fixed view on this because I've never built an O-gauge railway before, but it does work very well. I used um, c and components for all the point work, and I've been very pleased with it. Everything seems to work reliably, and uh, I've had no issues with it at all in the 10 years that the track's been down. Uh, for the point work, I used Templot software. Uh, it was a bit of a steep learning curve finding out how to use it, and I've probably forgotten most of what I learned because I haven't had to use it since I built the layout. So uh, I don't claim to be anything of an expert about it. Uh, if I was using it again, I'd have to start from scratch. But it did work very well. It allowed me to get the point work to look the way I wanted it to look and to fit the particular locations I was building it in. You might be able to tell from the clutter on the left that I tend to work in a bit of a jumble of stuff. I'm quite untidy in my working methods. It's, um, that's something I don't seem to be able to do without. As you can see, the trap work looks reasonably nice and flowing, I think. Uh, the lady prototype um, inaccuracies, I, I, I'm not any kind of a prototype track expert, but uh, it, it, it does look reasonably convincing to me. And it, as I say, it's worked very well for the last 10 years. Uh, the points all changed with um, tortoise point motors, and they've been completely faultless. I don't have any, I've never had any issue with any of those. Uh, locomotives, I wouldn't begin to try to build one now. When I was building an EM gauge railway before this O gauge railway, I did manage to build um, a 440 county chassis with compensation, and it did work reasonably well. But I realised that there's a huge learning curve in locomotive construction and kit building especially, and I just think I don't really have the time or the um, aptitude to encounter that. So what I've done, I've, I've restricted myself to ready-to-run locomotives. This is a um, Tower Brass 4575. Uh, I painted it with a brush because I thought, well, that's how the real things are painted. And I didn't really want to get into all the paraphernalia that people have to use for spray painting. So I know people make fantastically good jobs with spray paint, but I just thought that's not really for me. One day I expect I will tackle weathering, but I haven't really reached that point yet. That's the uh, 14XX, also from Tower Brass. Uh, all the locomotives are controlled with an NCE power cap controller. And uh, I think most of them have the uh, Simo BCC chips in. Uh, the narrow gauge line is operated with a very old comp speed CF, which is completely reliable. Now, moving forward a bit. Oh, <laughs> 
by one attempt at scratch building it. This little narrow gauge locomotive, it's meant to look a bit like um, uh, a Kerr Stewart's 442. Obviously, it's a, a, a sorry, 042, as I meant to say. It's an 040, and it's sitting on a Hornby Smoky Joe type chassis. Now, these 04, the, the Smoky Joe chassis are known for being much too fast for reliable operation. And that's certainly true of the old one, but this one is one of the Chinese ones, and it works beautifully. All right? It will crawl at a very, very slow speed, slower than scale walking pace, very reliable. And the locomotive has got lots of uh, weight inside it. Uh, you can see there are some parts of the Hornby body that I've used for the saddle tank, the smoke box, the chimney, the rest of it is just bits of brass and nickel silver. And I think I use uh, motion from uh, a Hornby uh, 47XX, I can't remember whatever it was. Uh, anyway, Hornby 00 uh, logo so, so that it had slide bars and the piston. Uh, the uh, brake band there is another attempt at to uh, scratch building that's running on top of a Pico uh, slate wagon. Uh, the, the band is built from, it's a plastic card. Now, on to inspiration. This is to cover off uh, an issue of uh, railroad model from the middle of the 1980s. And it was a layout built on a very, very small base board. It's a tail chaser that goes round and round. It was built by a gentleman, I think his name was Mr. A.C. Wood. The layout was called Breedon, spelled B-R-E-D-O-N. And um, although it doesn't show at its best in this cover photograph, there were other photographs I remember, but they don't have them, where it looked really beautiful. There was something about the atmosphere of it that I thought was very special in spite of the fact that it was very obviously double O gauge Pico set track with its very sharp curves and unrealistic flange waves, etc., etc. But I thought that um, Mr. Wood had managed to capture the idea of atmosphere by focusing on little scenes that he wanted to see. And uh, I thought it it, it, to me, it showed that you don't necessarily have to have very high uh, standards of authenticity to be able to create something that had atmosphere. Uh, this, is a, this is another uh, railway model of photograph from, I think, 1983. Um, a German gentleman, I think his name was Mr. Jürgen Mainhurt. I'm sorry if I pronounced that wrong. And his layout was called Abba Minach, and it was a Welsh layout built in Germany with a lot of German kit parts and uh, ready-to-run stuff. And I thought it was absolutely oozing Welsh atmosphere, and that was partly what set the ball rolling for me in thinking about what I wanted to be in my railway. Uh, after lolling around various Welsh ideas, and regular visits to Wales, I, put, I started making sketches, a lot of sketches, you know, sometimes with a sketch pad sitting on my lap while I was watching the TV, and I'd be doodling away. And the idea of um, a standard gauge locomotive running through Corris seemed very fascinating to me. Um, if you know Corris, and if you know where the narrow gauge line would want to run, um, you'll be aware that it's extremely close to the backs of the houses and it's a wonder that they managed to build a railway there at all. The idea of that having to uh, carry standard gauge trains, I found really intriguing. So I would be doodling little sketches like this quickly, lots and lots of them, uh, on, on the basis that one day perhaps I might be able to build something that use these ideas. I did, I saw a photo somewhere of uh, the tunnel at Penhelic, which is next to Abu Dhabi, and I was intrigued by seeing the um, rooftops of the 
the houses, more or less at the track level. And uh, I thought, well, that would be another idea that I'd like to incorporate in a railway. So again, I was out with the uh, pen and sketch pad and just doodling out ideas because it did strike me that having a rich pile of things I wanted to see might be a better place for me to start than with a track plan. I know a lot, a lot of people can start a layout design working on a track plan rather than thinking what they actually particularly want to see. Whereas for me, it had to be uh, something that was going to keep my interest up, something that I wanted to see in the finished layout. So I kept mulling over ideas of what I might want to see. This one, this sketch was loosely based on um, Chorus. It's not Chorus, but it was inspired by Chorus. Mm -hmm. Here's another one where I was, again, toying with the idea of a narrow gauge line and uh, very sharp curves, close proximity to cottages and uh, a viaduct with a stream running underneath. I did lots and lots of these. Same again. On the left here, you can see the, the train's running on a sort of embankment, which is right next to a park. Uh, now, if you're familiar with Blindhouse Estignard, if you wander around in the back streets, you do find places where the railway is perched up on um, an embankment leading to the viaduct, right next next to a path which is in turn is right next to the houses. And I found the atmosphere of the space just captivating. I thought I'd love to build that into a, a, a layout at some point. While I was doing all these sort of ideas, inspirational ideas, I was also mulling over some of the technical points because my earlier layout had never really been satisfying because of various reliability issues like wobbly boards or uh, joints from one board to the next that you couldn't count on the alignment being correct and all this sort of thing. So I was trying to figure out ways of making sure that the layout was going to be really solid and uh, dependable long before I started building it. And I think it paid off because the, the sort of technical features of my layout have actually been very reliable. While I was building the book, I was still sketching at the same time. So what I've got here is a photograph of the baseball which you've seen before. And I've put it into Photoshop and just started sketching out ideas of how the railway might look while I was at it. When I when I made this drawing I could see that there wasn't very much room above the tunnel now. So I decided to extend that back uh, wall, so to speak, a bit higher up, and to build a whole section that sat behind there, uh, poised above the uh, storage turntable. So it was still worth making sketches and planning ideas, even after I started building it. Uh, I also made a lot of mock-up buildings. You can see I've just used bits of old cardboard box to mock up the station and the group shed while I was playing around with my idea of where different bits should go. Like, as you can see, I was toying with the idea of bringing the group shed next to the running lines there. Time well spent, I think, because uh, an hour or two making up a mocked up building is much better than making a, an elaborate model that you then realise is wrong or doesn't, doesn't suit what you want. Mm -hmm. Now, back on the inspiration subject. Top left, that's Copper Hill Street Bridge in Abu Dhabi. And bottom right, it's my Kyson Street Bridge in Slam Idris. You can see that 
one is obviously inspired by the other. When I was a lad, back in the early 60s, uh, we'd go on family holidays to Abergavy, and I would stand at this location and watch the Cambrian Coast Express rumble over with uh, a manor in charge, and I thought that was just fabulous. And uh, the idea of being able to look up and see a train rumbling over a bridge like that made a very deep impression. That's why you've got the bridge that you can see on the bottom right. I can more or less recreate that experience by looking up from a low angle and seeing that um, same sort of scene. Uh, Abu Dhabi is definitely a sort of inspirational moment for me. Here we've got top left a cottage in Corris, uh, in Minford Street in Corris. As you can see, it's taken from uh, Google Street View, which is a fantastic resource for modelers, I think. And bottom right, We've got my cottage, which is obviously loosely based on the Corris cottage. I like the uh, decorative use of the arches, the brick arches over the wall, and I, I'm not sure quite what you should call the uh, way the brickwork has been arranged by the window. I'm sure some expert could tell me that, but uh, I, that was a feature I wanted to use. So in my model, I use uh, Adobe Illustrator software to print out the shapes of bricks onto a uh, card, and I laminated that onto two layers, so it's reasonably thick. And then I built the uh, stonework in between the bits of card using DAS or DAS clay, which I think is very flexible, um, excellent stuff. The way I use it is to put it on uh, a little glue underneath it to make sure it binds to the surface underneath. And uh, before it's completely dry, I then scratch in my stone shape. And then when it is dry, I finish it, on, finish it off with a bit of sandpaper. Uh, I know that some people like to leave it till it's totally dry. And if you're trying to model uh, uh, a warm, accurate course of bricks or something, you probably would have to do that because scratching into damp clay is quite likely to move it, allowed, move it around a little bit. But um, I think in uh, the case of uh, stonework like this, I don't think it matters. The station building itself at Clan is loosely based on Clanbury Maya, which is on the Cambrian main line. Uh, what I did was to, I visited it, found photographs of it on the state agent's website, and I reversed it so that it was the right, right way around to my layout, and I shortened it so it would fit the space I had available. Uh, I'll say a little bit more about the construction of that later on. But uh, I love the um, Cambrian station buildings. I thought they were very beautiful. And uh, I, I wanted to have, one of the things I wanted to see on my layout was one of these lovely, elegant uh, Cambrian station buildings. Plan Idris, September 1946. Uh, I did this illustration for uh, BRM magazine. They were kind enough to print an article on my layout, and I thought this might help to give an idea of what's meant to be happening around the railway. So you can see the blue area to the left is uh, where flood water has wreaked its havoc, and the two narrow gauge lines you can see uh, with, if you can see where I'm pointing now, that dotted line is meant to be the uh, completely derelict and abandoned Lake Railway going that way. And the other one, which is just about still in existence and just about operating on its last leg, is this one here. This 
area here is obviously the, the, the area that I've modelled, and the rest of it is purely imaginary. This is uh, a plan of the layout. Uh, now, I found it very useful to uh, work with um, Adobe Illustrator software. I mean, any vector drawing program will work, but what was good about using the computer software was being able to build things up in layers, for example, to move buildings around or to adjust the uh, curvature of tracks without having to completely redraw them. You can see over on the right hand side the train turntable, which is a bit pale and ghostly uh, because it's meant to be under the hill. The whole layout is, I think it's about 24 and a half feet long. I realise I'm very lucky having that space in my layout. I just happen to have a nice big shed in my garden. Now, back to back scene. Uh, this is one of the scenes I wanted to be able to see, looking up at the trains rumbling onto the bridge. Now, because the layout is fairly high up off the ground, unless you're very, very tall, you're going to be either level with it or looking only slightly down on it. Um, or if you're a child, you'll be looking up at it. So a sky was definitely something that needed to be there. Now, I mean, some layouts are at tabletop level, and I don't think there'll be much point in adding a sky to a layout sitting on a low table because it's not going to look as though it belongs there. But in my rail room, uh, a sky seems really essential. The perspective of the background looks a bit distorted now because we're looking at it from a fairly low angle. So, for example, if you look at the uh, chapel that's painted onto the back scene, it doesn't quite look right. It looks a bit, the, the perspective looks a bit wrong. But I don't think it matters too much. The rest of the back scene still has enough of a feeling of depth in it with the aerial perspective and the colours and tones that I was talking about earlier. For you to feel that it is in the background and that it's uh, receding away from you. Going back to Google Street View for a moment, I, mean, I don't know, perhaps everybody is already using it, but you can go pretty well anywhere in the country and see what Google's camera van has seen and just take a screen grab like this. And um, you've got uh, brilliant reference material for landscapes, and I did quite a lot of that, uh, just taking screen grabs, uh, as well as going and looking at the real thing. I just went out in freezing cold with a sketch pad and a little tray of watercolours, uh, and obviously a camera as well. But Google Street View is a brilliant resource, per se. Uh, we're looking at the bridge from a different angle now. You can see that the perspective has changed. That uh, chapel that I was talking about before looks different now. It still looks a little bit wrong uh, because we're looking from a very low angle. But it's not too distorted, so you can still accept it as being uh, something that's in the distance. And you can accept the street as receding away from you. So this is what I meant by saying that this isn't an exact science. You can't get it either sort of right or wrong. Once again, you look at the back scene here, you can see the chapel this time has become really flattened by the perspective. You know, there's a limit to how much magic you can do. If you move right to one side or the other, the back scene isn't really going to work. The perspective vaccine isn't going to work at all. But hopefully it shouldn't be too much of a distraction from the model. Uh, the big lump on the left behind the locomotive is the broken side up from one of the um, uh, narrow gauge railway, which has just been abandoned in, in its broken state. Now, I'm looking at a Constable 
landscape here to make a point. Uh, if you approach this painting in an art gallery, you can read that happily as being a landscape. You don't have any problems with the perspective because you know that you're standing to one side and your brain can compensate for it being uh, distorted. Makes no difference if you're looking at it from the other side. You, your brain can still cope with it and read it and uh, understand it. If you're looking at it straight on, it will look like that. But you already know that because you've seen it from a bit from the side. That's fine if you're painting a landscape that's going to hang on a wall. But yeah, if I'm painting back scenes go behind a, uh, a model railway, it's a, there's another challenge involved. And uh, it's what I've talked about before to do with things being perpendicular. So. I've mocked up a little back scene here. Back, I speak in inverted commas because this obviously this is a very quick, <laughs> quick bit of work. It's uh, a, there's a road receding into the distance, passing over this part of the um, layout, which is uh, on a flat surface, and going into this part of the layout, which is on a perpendicular surface. If we happen to be looking from this angle. The perspective looks okay. You can accept that the road is meant to be going away from you into the distance, getting narrow as it goes further back because of uh, vanishing point perspective. And if you were able to disguise the join between the back scene and the foreground area, you could accept that as being uh, the wrong picture. But if you move to the side, this happens. You suddenly got something that doesn't work at all. It looks um, like a sort of riding cobra or something. The, the part of the road that's on the back scene doesn't work because it's perpendicular. So what I've done in my layout is to try to avoid that situation by doing this. I've used a lot of fairly shallow diagonal shape, but by twisting the road to one side, uh, you can still read it from the front, but when you move it to the side, now it still looks more or less plausible. The perspective still more or less works. So it's not so offensive as if you draw the shapes in a perpendicular way. You know, it allows viewers to be to one side or the other without too much of a problem. Uh, once again, you can see that the uh, perspective of the uh, chapel in the background is not too offensive, even though we're a bit low down for the proper vanishing point. Uh, and the reason why it doesn't look too bad, I think, is because we're looking at it in a kind of diagonal perspective. We're looking at the corner of the building rather than straight onto it. If you put things flat against the picture plane, you know, so that they're facing straight onto the viewer, they're more likely to look wrong when you move to one side or the other. Uh, now, back to aerial perspective. I'm using the word perspective rather freely here, but aerial perspective is a specific term that artists use. And if you want to Google it, you'll find lots of uh, articles about aerial perspective. It doesn't mean drawing vanishing points or drawing shapes. It's purely to do with how colours and tones can create a sense of perspective uh, as they recede away from you. And this this picture does actually show how that works in practice. Again, the hill in the background looks very much paler than the hills in the foreground. So we can accept it as being a long way back. But that colour that I've used in the background has got very little or next to no green, possibly no green at all. Uh, There's more blues, greys, slightly purplish colours that I've borrowed from the colours I've been using in the sky. And as the hillsides move, the layers of hills come forward, they get more and more rich and more saturated and deeper in tone so that they appear to be closer to you. I think that was probably the thing that most people have commented to me about uh, how I achieved that effect. 
so that's something that's not really that difficult. As long as you accept it, if you're painting things that are meant to be a long way away, they won't be the local colour that you expect them to be. Right? Just because you know a tree might be deep green, there's no point in using deep green on it if it's meant to look far back on a misty hillside because it won't look that far. There's also no point in using fine detail on something that's meant to be a long way away because you probably wouldn't be able to see it in real life. So these trees, these groups of trees over here, are done very quickly and roughly. I mean, since this photograph was taken, I have actually made quite a few changes to this scene. Uh, this sort of gap here is gone. But the, the, the group of trees, they were done with probably two or three colours, with a kind of base colour put down first, and then uh, the light coloured stipples on again with a fairly stiff brush. When I say stippling, I just mean kind of dabbing on in, in a fairly free way. Nothing too careful or, or um, precise about it. In fact, it's best to avoid being too precise if you're trying to create that kind of impression. Obviously, you can see that on the sort of silhouette outlines of drill site, I've been a bit neater because those shapes do create quite a strong tonal contrast with whatever's behind them. Uh, this is looking out of the tunnel mouth along the layout, and uh, although the buildings look okay, the back scene on the right doesn't work at all. So there are definitely limits to how far you can push the various tricks I've been talking about in, in a back scene. You can see at the other end of the layout, you can see the, the flat surface that's at 90 degrees to the main wall. Um, so if you, if you can recall one of the first slides I showed, you can see how that corner works. I mean, the curvature in the corner is to prevent it having a, a sort of visible uh, corner with a, a dark line down the corner. That's what so I used, a, as I say, I used a piece of hardboard, I think it's hardboard or very thin MDF, I can't remember bent round in a sharp curve and, and sort of fixed to a former which which in turn fixed the wall. Side on, you don't have any problems at all really with perspective like this. Um, it's more or less uh, easy to draw the shape, getting smaller when they're further away, bigger when they're nearer, and to keep to a consistent kind of angle so that the houses look as though they're all pointing the same way up the street. Uh, the eye level that I took the picture from is only slightly below the uh, eye level of the um, buildings in the background. So that's the easy bit. And hopefully that's what people see most uh, readily when they come to visit the layout, if they're looking straight at the layout, that's the kind of thing they're going to see. Uh, most of those buildings in the background are painted on the back scene. This building here, which is the old derelict narrow gauge station, which is loosely based on uh, Torres Railway Station, as it used to be, is stuck onto the back scene with a little bit of low relief, but the roof is. It's slightly elevated from the background with a thin card, and there is a bit of modelling clay for, the, uh, for this stone wall here. But what I've tried to do is, instead of suddenly switching from axiom to model, I've used a number of kind of halfway stages. So some of the buildings might be partly on the back scene, partly actual model. Uh, I'm quite sure why I put that slide in. And it's not a very clear picture, there's a bit of out of focus going on there. Um, so I think I'll move swiftly on from that. Right, the models themselves. This is the row of cottages from Chrysler Street while they were being built. You can see that at this stage I was using thin plywood to build them. And uh, I was 
coating them in DAS, gas, clay, uh, to scratch the stonework into. And the roof tiles are made from uh, rows of uh, paper. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Now that's what you see from the front, but big secret, if you go around the back, you see that. Mm -hmm. Now you can see that the cottage here on the left has barely any depth to it. The one in the middle has more depth, but it's kind of squished in depth. The one at the front is more or less in a completely normal perspective. Now getting that transition was quite tricky. So I did a paper or card mock-up first, just to see if it looked right. And I had to do two, I had two or three goes, I think, until I was happy. But when I got a, a card model that looked okay, I could then take some measurements off it and make this, which, which uh, let's just go back to this one for a minute. You can see that the perspective does work reasonably well. So, the, the one at the back there, you can accept that as being just as real as the one at the front, even though it's actually only been that deep. Uh, that was a lot of experimentation, trial and error really, rather than science. These are some of the buildings on the back scene while I was in the middle of painting them. And you can see that I started sticking on some features in low relief, for example, the barge boards or some of the roof slates. Are stuck onto the back team. Uh, right, we've got some card mock ups there going on in the background. Those are not the models that you end up seeing on the layout, they're just me trying out shapes to see if I can do some more squished building that looks okay. So I just uh, chop them up with card or uh, knife and, and hack them about until they look reasonably right. When they when they look okay, that's when I start uh, taking a few measurements and building them a bit more carefully. Uh, hopefully, I've uh, got a photo that will show you that scene in its finished form a bit later. Another mock up going on there. So the building in the middle is obviously just a rough mock-up to see if I can get the perspective right, because that is nearly flat, that white mock-up there, and the stable block to the right of it, again, is nearly flat. I'll show you a picture of that from, the, from above in a little while. The cottages over on the left go from modelled in 3D over here to nearly flat over here. So everything, the roof, gets gradually more and more squished as I go further back. Again, a lot of trial and error. Uh, I'm a great believer in the idea that if it looks right, it probably is right, but it, you've, got to, you've got to kind of keep hacking away at it before it comes together. Now, what I've done here, the, the red graded area at the top of the layout plan is to try to express the idea of where the compression starts to happen. So as a, as a kind of general rule, the closer something is to the completely red area up here, the more I've squished it. And as the rain fades out, it, uh, models then become actual 3D solid models. I haven't stuck to that completely. There are some inconsistencies in that, but that's a kind of general rule. So it's really over an area of about four inches where the major part of the compression goes on. Uh, this scene, I don't think this features in the uh, video because the buildings in the middle haven't been built at the time of, of the video. Um, the area I'm pointing to there is more or less flat. There's a little bit of low relief going on in this building here. That building is 3D, but squished because that falls into the area of compression. These, 
buildings up here are completely flat. They're, they're either painted on the back seat or they're painted on bits of flat card which are stuck to the back seat. Here's the stable block, which is in uh, very shallow 3D, but, but um, almost flat. Robert, now we've had a few questions come in concerning the height of your back scenes and the, the height of the, the layout above the ground level. Roughly how, how high is the rail level above the ground? Uh, I can't remember the exact number, but it must be, uh, let me think, uh, the, the lowest point is probably about 3 foot 9, I think. Uh, uh, and with the track, the, the level of the track is probably at about four foot four, uh, or, or maybe a bit more than that, heading on closer to five feet. And then the, the, the back scene will extend right up to the ceiling of the shed, which is whatever that is, seven feet or whatever. That. So what? Uh... And regarding your, your buildings, your finished buildings, are they made of plastic or wood or cardboard or what? Uh, there's, a, there's a mixture there. Uh, as I said earlier, a lot of them started off with uh, thin plywood, but I then switched to using card, 1.5mm uh, card, because I found it much easier to work with. And what I've generally done is to build a sort of a framework inside from uh, either balls or thin strip wood or whatever you call it, and uh, coating it with uh, a layer of card. And I've coated the card with knotting, which is a kind of dilute form of shellac, uh, which is a great material. I mean, it, it's very good at resisting the attacks of oil paint and water. And it lasts a long time. I mean, I've got one or two buildings that I made in four millimetre scale that are in use on my grandson's layout. And I, I must have built them about 40 years ago, and they, they look fine. Uh, so now I stick to uh, card on top of the wooden frame and uh, shellac before I put on any uh, dash clay or anything like that. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt. No, no problem. Um, yeah, so here, this shows the, the building that's nearly flat next to the one that's modelled in shallow 3D. And I've tried to make sure that the perspective follows on from one to another. That was quite a challenge, but again, with a bit of trial and error and experimentation, it sort of reasonably works. If you see the two gentlemen standing here in front of this back door, they can actually only just squeeze in behind that door. There's so little space there that they're more or less a push fit into that space in the, what looks like a backyard. There's actually very little room for them at all. So it's, it's, that is a lot flatter than that appears to be. Um, this is the derelict viaduct. Um, the this end it goes over the standard, it would have gone over the standard gauge line. This part of it goes over the narrow gauge line and, and it, carry, it carries the line that is now uh, derelict and um, abandoned. Uh, and that passes in front of these cottages here. I took this photo with my phone, with it, which was on the end of a my arm, which is a bit wobbly, so I'm sorry it's not very clear, but I just thought I'd include it for illustrative purposes. You can see these are the buildings from the previous slide. I'll go back to that one in a moment. So you can see that this one has hardly got any depth to its floor. It's, uh, it's nearly flat. And uh, uh, this is the building next to it, which has got some depth, although it's fairly compressed. So just dropping back to the previous slide for a moment. That's the one that's nearly flat. That's the one that's partially 3D. Uh, this shows the stable block, which is probably about half an inch deep. And uh, the house behind it, or the houses behind it, which are 
I think, completely flat, apart from a little, maybe a little bit of low relief in the form of barge or, or drain pipes or something like that. And, and if you can see down in this corner, bottom right hand corner, you can see the two gentlemen who were standing in the backyard. You can see how they had to be squished in behind that wall. Over here on the left, you can see the very distorted shape of the row of cottages, which, um, hopefully from the front, looks reasonably 3D, but again, this falls in the kind of compression zone. So that's why it's been distorted so much in that area. Now, this um, abandoned line here that stops at the uh, collapsed viaduct, I'm trying to give the impression that there is space for a narrow gauge line to run in front of the, this wall here where the two chaps are speaking, and to run through that gate and behind the stable, stable block. Uh, there's actually almost no space at all behind this fence here. But because it looks similar to the edge that runs out onto the bridge, I think it looks reasonably plausible that there is a space there behind it. You can accept that, you know, because it looks, uh, it sort of continues into the bit that you can see where there is space. This um, black shed here, which is a sort of carriage shed for the Narragage line, is a recent addition. And it's uh, that's fairly compressed, and there's only just about room to get uh, anything inside it. But uh, I think it it looks reasonably plausible from most angles. Right there are the two chaps speaking with the backyard again. Now to make them look as though they've actually got more than uh, a tiny little space there. I've, Try to emphasize this corner of this wall here. You can see that on this part of the wall, if you can see where my cursor is pointing, on this part of the wall, I've used lighter color to fit in with the general direction of, of daylight in the, in the whole model, which is so that the daylight is coming from the right hand side and the front, front surface of this wall is a bit darker. So that I've tried to create the impression of a 90 degree corner bed even though there's hardly any kind of angle there at all. Same thing goes on here. I've used the lighter colour on the stonework here and here to try to create a sense of having a corner there, even though there isn't really one. Just been asked, have you had any artistic training? Sorry, can you repeat please? Have you had any artistic training? Uh, yeah, I, um, I used to be an art teacher in my younger days, <laughs> and, uh, uh, I did uh, go to art college, uh, but I don't want to kind of make too much of a point of that because some of the things I'm doing, I think you don't have to be a kind of highly accomplished picture painter to be able to do, and some of it is fairly straightforward when you understand what's going on. Right, over here on the left, there's a cottage which is completely flat. It's actually stuck to the back scene, and uh, it, it has got no depth at all, apart from the barge boards here being stuck on bits of card, and I think some of the roof slates are stuck on. This is the cottage that's fully modelled, this, this bit here. So we're going from fully modelled to flat. And... The perspective works okay from this angle. If you were to be able to see the, the cottage on the left, as you move to the right or to the left, it would look really wrong and clashing. So um, you, I arranged so that you can't. When you move to the side, that's what you see. That cottage has disappeared. The, the one that's flat has disappeared between the, behind this um, 3D one. So, if I just go back a moment, you only know, see that cottage where it didn't need to let you see, if that makes sense. 
So if you move to either side, it gets hidden. Um, I think uh, Ian Wright, uh, in his one of his modelling books, coined the term view blockers. I think, well, that speaks for itself. You, you, you don't kind of allow people to see what you don't want them to see. Now, this is the scene that I was talking about earlier, where there were some uh, cottages that were just rough white card models. Now they've been modelled in uh, 3D, uh, in, in, well, in some level of 3D, and uh, more solidly with my usual card and gas clay construction. Uh, I wanted to try to create a fairly kind of intimate, close, um, uh, environment where there, there isn't very much space between anything because that's the way some of these uh, villages look to me, especially places like Corris. You've got little pathways that seem squished in between other things. Now, back to building construction for a minute. This is one of the earlier buildings. This is a forge, and I think it was based on uh, some forges. Which I think you can visit now as a kind of tourist site. Um, it's built on thin plywood, but it could just as easily have been done with the card that I use these days. And you can see where the, the where the gas clay finishes. That will give you a sense of how thickly I put it on. Uh, and uh, you can see that I uh, put the colours on in a fairly loose way. You know, there's no picking out one stone carefully at a time. I mean, if you're familiar with the work that they do at Pendant Museum, a lot of the buildings there, beautiful as they are, they, they seem almost too neatly done to me. Um, and I've tried to go for something that's a bit more kind of generalised. So I, I use my colours quite loosely, swap them about a bit, and then if I want to pick out the odd stone here or there that looks so it should be a different colour, then that's what I do. I work with a few different colours on my palette and just uh, add them as whatever seems to look right. Same building again. Sorry to get out of focus at one end. That's the good shed. Uh, this is loosely based on the one at Sandrin Meyer. I didn't manage to get close to it. It still exists, but I didn't manage to get onto the uh, property. Uh, so I took one or two photos from this and looked for photos on the web. And uh, there's a certain amount of conjecture going on there. Guess But um, uh, that's filled with cards rather than play plywood. Uh, there's a reasonably sturdy wooden frame behind the car. And uh, the stonework was done in the same way where the uh, dust clay was put on and then scratched into it while, while it was still damp. Uh, it does mean some of the lines get a bit distorted and so I have to kind of squidge them about to get them back more or less where I want them. But it seems to work reasonably well at the way of getting the, the big heavy blocks of stone. I mean, none of these models would stand up to the scrutiny of the pendant museum types. You know, I mean, like the, the detail on the front of the doors, for example, is very uh, sketchy and uh, done on the, sort of, if it looks all right from the three feet away, then it probably is okay. It wouldn't stand up to a uh, magnifying. Now, when it came to the station building itself, I thought I'd try and make a bit more of a neat job of this. So I drew it up uh, in Adobe Illustrator and tried to work out exactly what it was going to look like before I started work. And so as you can see, I planned it more or less in the same way that you'd plan a real building. And I built it with uh, a framework, my usual framework, Card, but I also some of the walls done with thin perspex, clear perspex, so that the windows would already be in place. What I had to do was then laminate layers of card around the window openings, and I'd have all the glazing in place before I, before I started. Uh, one of the 
key things that attracted me to Sunbury MySpace was beautiful barge boards. So I found, uh, looked at one of the photographs of the barge boards and I drew this up in Adobe Illustrator. And uh, they are actually pretty close to what, what you find at Sunbury Mire. So the pointy bits at the bottom are the finials. I thought I'd make more than I actually needed just in case some of them got broken while I was putting it together. And I sent them off to a chap who um, advertised on one of the model forms. I can't remember where it was now, but uh, he later cut them for me very cheaply. And um, this is the result on the model, which I'm very pleased with. I mean, I could never have cut those uh, holes in the bar towards myself. I don't have the dexterity, but uh, it, that's definitely a, a method that I would come back to using laser cutting for where it's appropriate. Uh, you can see the face of the platform there is done with one of the double O gauge wheels, scenic sheet uh, as a sign as a time saving method. I mean but the um, size blocks of stone that are used in this kind of construction seems to vary enormously. So I thought there's no reason why a double O gauge block of stone couldn't look okay on a seven millimeter scale layout. Roof slates. What I what I've done, it's not revolutionary, and I'm sure that probably loads of people have done it before. But I drew this up in Adobe Illustrator. I mean, again, sure, any vector drawing package would do the job. And printed these out. And when they were printed out, I coated them in um, uh, knotting so that they would be resistant to any oil paint that I used. The paper wouldn't rot over time. And then I'd cut. Uh, with a knife every, above every second row. So I could use each of the upper rows on the strip side cut as a guide for the next row that was going down, if that makes sense. And then the vertical clips between the slates were cut just up to the line in the middle of the strip, so between the upper and the lower rows. I hope that makes sense. I, mean, I can elaborate on that, obviously, if anybody wants to know. Now, for the distorted building, you can't expect to use um, ordinary rectangles because the shapes you're seeing are not going to look like rectangles if buildings are at a weird angle to you and, and squished into pictorial perspective. So I had to do a lot more trial and error here, distorting the shapes of the slate using Adobe Illustrator, but uh, once again, you could use any drawing package. Uh, and with trial and error, I got them to more or less look like slates should look when they were being seen uh, in perspective on, on a you know, shallow, low relief building. Uh, this is the narrow gauge good shed. Uh, I drew, it up, drew all the parts up in Adobe Illustrator and Printed them out and then uh, stuck the various bits onto clear perspex. So once again, I'd have the uh, window already glazed before I got started. And that's it under construction. Uh, so at the end, uh, I just stuck on in a fairly haphazard way so that I'd have something to come up to with my uh, clay. And I wasn't concerned about the gaps uh, between the bits of card because I knew I could just fill them in as I chose with either glue or clay. Um, and I, I knew it took all right. It, it did actually take me a lot longer than I expected it to this model, but it, it seems to have worked out okay. Uh, if anyone's interested, this was my uh, little narrow gauge logo. As I say, it was based on a Kerr Stewart uh, 042 design, but it was adapted to be an 040 with the uh, horn, the Smokey Joe, the front end. Uh, 
I'm sorry to give it a basic colour. I then made the lining in Adobe Illustrator. I could not have painted that lining with a paintbrush. I mean, my hands aren't that steady, uh, but I found it very easy to uh, create that in an Illustrator. Obviously, I just had to keep careful measurements. Uh, but uh, I then printed the lining and the colour inside the line onto paper from, uh, I think it's the Crafty Computer Company or, or Crafty Computer Paper. Or, uh, if anyone, again, if anyone's interested, I can find out. But they, they do a paper design for this job, which, will, which you can then turn into decals. And uh, then well, I stuck it, I, I, I applied it like any other decal, and then uh, used a little bit of jiggery pokery with the colours around it, so I matched the colours of the logo to what I printed out, and then it's, it's been varnished over. But I couldn't have achieved that uh, lining, in, I don't think I could have done it in any other way. Right, back to the email back at the engine strip. This was the um, stonework underway. You can see that I, I've used the, the bits of uh, stone that have been cut around the windows to guide where my clay stops and starts. That's it when it's gone a bit further. The shiny appearance is because I've put some rotting on top of it. I'm a great believer in rotting. Um, it seems to be very good stuff making things look a bit harder. And, um, you know, if you've got some kinds of stone blocks have a kind of hard, shiny appearance to them. But even before it's painted, it seems to help to put some rotting on. Uh, uh, as well as protecting the paper and card from damage by oil paint. And that's it in situ. So that, that's been painted. And when I'm doing this kind of Welsh stone, I generally use kids poster paints first uh, to just get a general all over colour. And then I start using either artist colours or uh, oil colours or acrylic, more or less as the mood takes to uh, paint stones. Uh, if you look at the slates on the roof there, those are those are slates done in the way that uh, I described earlier with the printed out sheets. I mean, I haven't really spent all that long on the painting, and I'll probably come back to do a bit more work on that. Uh, this is an idea that probably isn't that revolutionary, but I thought. Uh, when I built the uh, train turntable, I could easily imagine a disaster happening where one of the locos or one of the vehicles just runs off the end of the turntable and plunges four feet to destruction on the floor. So what I've done here is I just extended bathroom bolts, uh, the bit that you put hold of the sort of knob bit, I extended it with a bit of brass tube. And then that lays down flat across the track so nothing can pass the bolt when the uh, train is on the turntable and the turntable isn't aligned with the running line. Uh, that was, I, I, I thought that was quite a clear <coughs> idea and it seemed to have worked. I haven't had anything plunged into it soon. Here we are back to where we started at the north end of the layout, um, looking at uh, where the line finishes. And I think. That is my lot as far as slides are concerned. So I, I'd be very happy to answer anything that anybody would like to ask. Robert, we have a question from John Hobden. How do you cut out the window frames in Adobe Illustrator? Uh, I, if I print something out that's got window frames uh, and, and stick it onto uh, Perspex, I then use a scalpel and a straight edge and just cut carefully uh, run. Oh, I should say that when I stick the paper on, I'm using gummed, uh, you know, ready sticky paper. paper uh, you can get large label paper 
which is excellent for the purpose. I mean, if I just back up a minute to this slide here, this <coughs> bit with the uh, windows printed onto it is sticky label paper. Uh, so that's easy to stick onto the first bit. And the sharp scalpel blade uh, makes it quite easy to take out the gaps where the windows are. Right, so you, you print print off your windows onto sticky label paper. Yeah. And stick, then stick it on the perspex and then yeah, put up the... I, I'm not sticking on one window at a time, I'm sticking the whole side of the building on. And then uh, cutting out the window gaps. And then I'm laminating the rest of the uh, wall afterwards to build up the deck. Uh, so, on top of that perspex and paper that you can see there, there's going to be at least a couple uh, of other layers of card on the top before we get to the layer of dashed clay. I see. That's, that's excellent. Thank you. A bit earlier on, you were talking about the fact that uh, you'd been an art teacher. Have you got any tricks of the trade that you could pass on to us regarding colours? I know you're saying. Yeah. Make them lighter yeah. in the background. Yeah, I, I, I'll just back up to one of those slides. <coughs> that one will do. Um, the colours that I've used on the hillsides in the background, I've got quite a hefty dollop of sky colour mixed into them. That's the kind of overall. So, for example, it would still work even if you were doing a kind of sunset sky or something. You take your pale gold colours and blend that with the colour that you expect the landscape really ought to be. You'll end up with a colour that might look strange on the palette, but it will look right when you put it on the picture. And you've got to be prepared to use quite a lot of your sky colour. <coughs> If you look at this area of the picture here, that hillside there is only a small pad darker than the sky above it. But you can accept it as being uh, a hillside because it's got an edge to it and it's a little tiny bit darker. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and as I said before, I would avoid using any dark colour, even when you know something is meant to be dark. You know, if you had a black building in the distance, don't paint it black, you know, make it much paler because it's a long way away. They don't, you know, don't be tempted to use black for any small details or anything, because if you do, they will jump forward. You know, if you want something to look a long way away, you've got to keep all the colours light and tone and not very saturated. You know, I mean, uh, when I talk about saturation, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, like the strength of the colour itself. So when you when you're doing it, would you start off with this sky colour first? Yeah, uh, I think that's a, a good approach from a practical point of view. I mean, if you're painting something that's stuck on a wall, it's easier to start at the top. But uh, I should have said earlier. I mean, when I'm doing a painting like this, I do a small brush first. Um, I mean, that room is 24 feet long, and if I'd painted it and thought, no, that doesn't quite look right, I had to do it all again, I'd have wasted hours. So I do a small scale down brush first, and if it looks right on the small scale, then it will probably look right when it's big. Uh, if, that seems, if that sounds difficult, then you can always uh, draw a grid of squares on it, and the grid of squares on your big surface. Um, number squares so that they've got a kind of reference, you know, so you know that you're painting in square 1A or 2B or whatever it is. I hope that makes sense for a minute. Um, it's just so that you know that you're drawing the same bits in the same place on the, on the picture. But certainly spend a lot of time doing small, quick versions first. Uh, I mean, if you can't make something look right when it's small and quick, it's not going to look right when you spend a long time doing the big version. Well, thank you very much. That that that's uh, that's explained that. 
So if anybody's got any questions that uh, you want to ask, <coughs> please, uh, please fire away either at using chat or if you want to mute yourself. Uh, Jackie's trying to keep quiet and not cough too much so that uh, you can uh, hear Robert because she's using the mobile phone to uh, transmit the signal. It's with technical problems, isn't it? So if anybody's got any questions, please, please come forward and ask them. Stephen Smith's got his hand up, Tony. Ah, I've missed that. Stephen, go ahead. Hi, Robert. That's that's brilliant. It's a wonderful um, piece of work. I, I really like what you've done and what you've been able to achieve with the uh, um, with the forced perspective. Can I ask a practical question about window frames, um, which has been asked, you know, the, the basic technique you, you've described. Um, but when you do the squished buildings, presumably the window frames can't be rectangles anymore. Are you able to predictably do those and in the squished format that they're going to have to be like that, um, using Illustrator, or do you have to do them by by eye in each case? Uh, short answer is yes, you have to do it. I, I do it by trial and error. There is a certain amount of uh, predictability about it. I mean, if you understand vanishing point perspective, uh, that would be a good starting point. Um, where uh, it's the kind of thing that some people learn in school where they draw a straight building or a straight road disappearing to a point on the horizon and all the lines converging. And obviously uh, that still is relevant to some degree when you're trying to put things into perspective in a back seat. So shapes like buildings, sorry, shapes like windows will no longer necessarily be rectangles. But with the kind of buildings I'm doing, quite a lot of them are quite roughly built cottages. So the shapes may not be that um, rectangular anyway. You know, you've got, there's a certain amount of tolerance for these kind of fairly, uh, what's the word, rustic looking buildings. Um, sometimes I've had to think about which part of the window frame I want to show if a building is in kind of squished perspective. I, I think, well, I may not be able to see the frame all, from all directions. I may only be able to see the frame from one side. Part of it might be hidden by the window reveal um, on the mirror side, for example. So short answer, trial and error. Thank you very much for that, Robert. We do have a few further questions. Uh, Peter Dalton, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Peter was saying that your trees look good. Uh, and how have you gone about doing the trees? Well, the painted, the painted trees are generally started with a sort of rough shape of the uh, uh, main branches and uh, trunks and so forth. And then the, the clusters of leaves are sort of stippled on with generally a couple of um, lighter or darker tones of green. I think when I say the word green, I kind of sound a note of caution there because very often clusters of leaves may not actually look very green. You can see the leaves on the right of this slide are fairly yellowy or um, in some places nearly uh, pale bluey grey colours. So don't take colours for granted. You know, you don't have to be too literal about um, what colours to expect to see. I mean, that's where going out and looking at the real thing comes uh, to hand. You know, going out with a, a camera or a sketch pad and, or some watercolour paints comes in handy. Now, um, there are actually quite a few trees that are due to be modelled in 3D on the layout, but I haven't tackled any of that yet. I mean, there are many things that I haven't yet tackled. For example, a signal box and some um, old point rodding and... Uh, you know, various, well, many small details, but um, <coughs> that's, for, that's for the future. Thank you very much. Uh, Andy Ball has asked, are the lighter coloured buildings painted using the same paint, but with a dollop of sky colour, or you can use pale grey or white to lighten them up? Uh, 
I, I vary the colour all the time. So rather than rather than mixing up a sort of large pot of building colour, which I, I know that's the kind of approach that people might take to painting trains. You know, you might think you've got to put correct Great Western locomotive green colour. But when you're painting buildings that are at different distances, I think you have to be prepared to change it constantly. So on your palette of colours, you want to have a range of tones of colour. I, I mean, I hope, uh, by tones, I mean light or darker shades of that same colour. And I kind of get into them at will, according to what looks right. I try to remember the kind of golden rule that things that are further away are much less likely to have any deep tones in them. And when they are in the distance, they're never going to have any black. Thank you. Um, Alex, I believe, had his hand up. Would you like to unmute and uh, ask your question? I see. This is very informative of this uh, layout, Robert. Um, I've been working so hard uh, throughout lockdown as I have my, uh, my favourite simulator called the Model Railway Easily as I design layout. It was a lot of hard work. I've done like three things. So I'm starting to... Uh, blow my mind that time for what I'm going to design my own layout. It's called the uh, Scunful Brock Speed Gullet, but it's coming up um, slowly at the moment, but I am struggling to find the layout design because it's going to be no gauge and it'll be too big to to make a big room for this one. I, I think the whole question of layout design is an interesting one. Uh, I mean, what I... When I first got into railway modelling as an adult, I started with looking at track plans and I realised that that wasn't really going to work for me. I thought it was more important to try to imagine scenes that I wanted to see on the finished thing, then find a way of getting them into some kind of a track plan that made sense. And I mulled over the idea for several years and uh, in a way, I was quite lucky because I had a period of about five years when I knew I was going to build, but I couldn't start it because it, it involved a house move. So I had plenty of time to sort of sketch ideas and think about the practical possibilities before it actually happened. And um, uh, I think that I must have done about 150 layout plan before I actually started work and I'm very pleased that I did. Uh, my earlier railways, which were in either double O or EM gauge, all tended to have problems that were kind of built in from the word go because I just hadn't got the design right. Um, I mean there's a temptation, I think for a lot of people, to try to put in more than they could really realistically can. And in a way I got that going on in San I mean, when I started it off, I thought, oh, I can't possibly get the narrow gauge section and the standard gauge railway going on. It's just going to look much too clutter. But I seem to have managed it just about, but it, it, it's difficult. I mean, it's, it's like the design stage is something not to be rushed. And I, I would actually recommend making a model of the model you're going to make. So before I built this, I built a, a, a kind of model on a, on a plank of wood about three feet long of what, you know, scaled down model of my model. So I could see what would fit where and what might look right where. And although that's all time consumed, I think it was time well spent because yeah. since I've been building the, the layout the last few years, I haven't once thought, oh, if only I'd done it differently. I, you know, I'm quite happy to stick with what I've got because I, I've got a lot of time into thinking about it before I started. Robert, we're going to have to wind up very shortly because uh, Jackie's phone battery is going flat. Uh, so if anybody's got another quick question, um, one from Tim Stubbs was, have you built or weathered any wagons yourself? They look very good. All the wagons I built for kids, 
and I read it and all my stuff. I, I, I did actually have a very particular, particular kind of look I wanted for them. I wanted them to look kind of very well used and sort of grubby, but not covered in um, <laughs> not covered in mud, let's put it politely. And, <laughs> um, I used, uh, I think it was powdered pastel crayon to, to get the sort of emphasized kind of black lines in between the, the plant on the rug and and uh, I, I, I rubbed in, uh, I think it was a bit of charcoal, and, and I picked out the bits that I thought were most likely to go rusty as well. Thank you very much, Robert. Well, we're having one or two people uh, thanking us, and thanking you rather, for all of you, you've been telling us today. Um, I think we need to hand over back to Jackie to uh, run some final bits and pieces. I'd like to say thank you, Robert. It has been an absolute pleasure listening to your speech. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Robert, thank you. That was absolutely amazing. I'm sorry, it was my squeaky chair and I've been trying really hard to keep as quiet as possible despite having a cough. Um, so I hope I haven't interrupted things too much, but having the phone in front of me, I couldn't mute. <laughs> Um, so, can you stop screen sharing for me, yep. Robert, now? Okay, and I have just got a couple of slides to show people, um, which are about our next evening with. Um, so, I'll just bring these up. It looks like Bob's got some earrings on. <laughs> Um, I'm going to just move the phone out of the way a moment so it doesn't reverberate. I'll just take off the speaker if I may. I'm sorry about that, Robert, because it means you can't speak back, but it just means that um, it doesn't sort of echo. Um, so our next evening with is planned for Saturday the 26th of February. Um, booking will open at midnight tonight. And Rob Bishop, many of you may know, he's... Uh, a member of the events team. He's our trained and qualified electrician and does all of the things that are needed to make our exhibitions work. But he's also spent many, many years building O-gauge models in brass and in nickel silver. He's done a fabulous soldering demonstration video that's been on our virtual shows. I've had quite a lot of requests from people who are new to soldering and still think it's a bit of a dark art. And other people who say, I've been doing it, but there's things I still get wrong. <clears throat> Who'd like to have a question and answer session with Rob? So when the joining instructions come out, you can look at the video again as an aid memoir, but please do send your questions in advance for this one. So any, any issues you've got, it doesn't matter how big, how small, no question is a silly question. It would be really good to have your questions in advance so that Rob can make sure he's got the props in front of him and he can hopefully go through any tips that you need People have difficulty cleaning tips, knowing what soldering iron to use. He does all of the tuition on resistance soldering as well. So well, well happy to talk to you about anything to do with soldering with brass and nickel silver. Um, our face-to-face -face shows are returning. So um, we will be going ahead on the 5th of March with our Kettering Spring Show. Um, we have sent out with the gazettes, which will be arriving with you soon, the worst case scenario of what you had to do if there weren't any restrictions lifted. Obviously, as of tomorrow, they are lifting restrictions. So you can throw that piece of paper in the bin and hope that nothing comes back before the 5th of March. Um, but yes, we're booking. Advanced tickets are available on the website now. We've got a full complement of usual traders, five layouts plus the test track, demonstrations, including Rob. Um, so there'll be lots of things for you to come and enjoy face to face again back at um, Kettering. I would like to say that although the face to face shows are returning, 
We will still have one virtual show every year in November. We've just scheduled that for the 5th of November and we will be continuing with our monthly evening with seminars because people have asked that they continue and run in parallel with the face-to-face shows. Dates for the rest of the year, so 5th of March in Kettering, the 11th of June in Doncaster, which is a week later than normal, because we thought clashing with the Queen's Bank Holiday Jubilee would probably not be appropriate. And I'm sure you'll all be out doing the street parties and enjoying things that are happening that weekend. And then Gildex will be on the 3rd and 4th of September at the new venue in Stafford, Bingley Hall on the Stafford County Showground. Um, So please, if you want flyers, you can get them from Leslie in the office. We'll have loads of them to hand out to people at Kettering as well. Um, So if you're able to spread flyers around your local clubs and shops for us, that would be really helpful. In terms of membership, from the 6th of November, we started a free trial of membership benefits. So people can actually join us for one month free of charge. They'll have access to all of the things on the website so they can have a look at the Gazette, the Gazette archives, the wiki, all the traders listings, the product directory, the YouTube channel, the gallery, see what forthcoming events and forums are happening, access the forum for advice, Um, with the hope that people will get a real feel for the fact that the Guild is not just about a quarterly magazine. We have lots more to offer people and hopefully they'll convert to full membership at the end of the month. Um, So do tell people who might be interested in O-Gage that that offer is available. Um, It's very easy to access. And of course, now we have rolling membership as well. Um, So you can join online, you can actually just literally where it says about us on the front page of the website, join online and then at the bottom of the form, you can select free membership for one month or full membership 28 student 5 overseas 33. So it's very easy to show somebody how they can join us if anybody's interested. So thank you to everybody for joining us. Um, Next time, it's Saturday, the 26th of February for Soldering with Rob Bishop. And Robert, I'd just like to say, I will put you back on speaker again now. Um, A huge thank you, because I think, you know, I'm fascinated by perspectives and that depth of field. Um, I'm not an artist. I I will try and practice with your sketching and trying to do that colouring because I think hopefully we can all have a go at that and you've shown us in an excellent way how to have a try. Um, But it's a stunning layout. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Okay, thank you very, very much, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your evening and... If we don't see you in February, we'll certainly see you in Kettering, but hopefully we'll see you in both. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Tony. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Thank Thank you. you.